So, so, so. So, let's tell you the other uh, offers explanation of uh, this will take place on Good Friday, and what is accomplished on Good Friday is you know, very clear. Okay? So, he draws us into the circle of his life. But also, to understand it from this point of view, that yes, the sacrifice is offered. So Christ offers a sacrifice to who? To? Christ is sacrificed because he is sacrificed. Okay? The kill, the slave, the oppression. So what slays Jesus is our sinners. So basically it's like we are the murderers of the Son of God. We murder the Son of God. You remember Cain and Abel? When Cain killed Abel, what happened to the life of Cain? Abel? He died, but what happened? His blood cried out to God. For what? For vengeance. Okay? So in the literature we are told that the blood of Jesus cries out more insistently than that of Abel. The first uh, Eucharistic prayer. <laughs> yes. So vengeance basically, when you kill someone, their blood is life, so their life cries out to God, and God is going to revenge. Okay? Revenge for the blood. What is so new when scripture says the blood of Christ it cries out more consistently or pure or pure than that of Abel, is that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ sacrificed okay, by our sinners when we offer it to God, it doesn't cry for vengeance. It cries for reconciliation. So in other words, we shed the blood of the Son of God. Instead of the blood crying out enemies, Jesus says, forgive them. Because I'm offering myself freely for their reconciliation with you. Their reconciliation with God. So, the Father accepts the perfect oblation of Jesus Christ. He receives it. Because it is pleasing to him. It is out of total humility and obedience. So it is accepted by the Father. But the Father accepts the gift for to reconcile the murderers of his son. To reconcile sinners. So when Christ offers the sacrifice, the Father receives it. And then the Father gives it as a gift to sinners for reconciliation. So the Son offers the gift to the Father, the Father accepts the gift of the Son, and the gift of the Son is offered by the Father back to us as a gift of reconciliation. So when the Father gives the gift, this is the Eucharist in reconciliation, he says, take and eat, take and drink. That's why reconciliation is achieved, accomplished in communion. Holy Communion. Holy Communion means accepting the gift of the Father. The gift of the Father is what? His life, His goodness, His truth, and so on and so forth. So the Eucharist is not simply accepting something in our hands or on our tongue. It is accepting the totality of what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is. It is accepting obedience. It's accepting humility. It's accepting everything. That's why we always say that anyone who opposes what the gift is and yet claims to be in communion with God is a liar. 
That's why we call it Holy Communion. It's not like a, a pizza banquet, okay? Where we just to go. We have to believe and accept everything the Father offers to us. Everything the Father offers to us. And that acceptance is basically uh, embraced by the Amen. The body of Christ, Amen. Yes, I believe it's all this that the Father offers. So that's why a person who opposes church teaching, who opposes the gift of truth, who opposes the very gift you know, God is offering, and yet claims to be in communion, is Judas. You are kissing me, you are embracing me as you betray me. Now that is different from recognizing my sinfulness. I recognize I fall short. That's why I need God's help. That's different from being simply stubborn and saying that I will not believe ABCD. I believe everything, but sometimes I find myself falling short. That's the reality of our Christian journey. So that's why we repent. That's why we have the sacrament of reconciliation. That's different from a person who says that I don't believe in ABCD, but I'm, I will come to communion anyway. That there's, so there's a fundamental difference there. Sin is sin, period. But someone who comes to us and tells us that well, these sins are no longer sins, that person is extremely dangerous. That's why sometimes you hear people say, why are we so hooked up on abortion and homosexuality and things like that? Well, because no one has shown us, shown up yet to tell us that adultery is okay. Okay, everybody believes that adultery is wrong. Okay? Nobody is showing up to tell us that stealing is okay. But someone is showing up to tell us that destroying life is okay. And you can be a good Christian, a good Catholic, in good standing with God, with truth, as you destroy life. We say no. That's why we keep talking about it. Because someone is telling us that it's no longer sinful. The homosexual acts, okay? Including so-called homosexual marriage. Why are we talking about it all the time? Because someone is coming to tell us it's no longer sinful. Not that these sins are so much greater than the other sins, so I can like, you know, commit adultery and steal, but as long as I'm not aborting or committing homosexuality, then I'm okay. No. But someone is telling us to coming to tell us and tell us that these things are okay. You hear people say that these are, these are, no, not here, I mean, the church, <laughs> the church in general. Yeah. There's some people coming to tell us that, well, it's not, this is no longer a sin. That's the difference. We acknowledge our sinfulness and we repent. But if sin is no longer sin, then there is no need to repent. Because I'm not doing anything wrong. Because I'm redefining what sin is. So God is offering the gift, and I'm saying, well, it's not actually what you're offering. Okay? I redefine, reinterpret, reform whatever you're giving to me, that I'm in communion with you. It's a lie. That's why we say, people, so I do whatever you do, you can't come to Holy Communion if you come in that obstinacy of heart, stubbornness of heart, you are committing a mortal sin. Okay, angry. It doesn't matter. They got angry they got angry with Jesus. So who am I to think that people don't get angry? Okay? So that is the difference. Why? Because there is a the problem with us, some Catholics who think that they are very faithful to think that they receive Holy Communion because they are very good. Why do we need the Communion? Why do we need Communion? What, 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 what do we say when we consecrate the blood of Jesus? He took the cup, okay? Your thanks. So this is the blood of... 
you come back in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. So if I'm holy, I don't need the Eucharist. You see that Pharisaic tendency, okay? The Pharisees didn't need Jesus because they were, they were holy anyway. And Jesus tells us that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So we shouldn't delude ourselves thinking that I come to receive Holy Communion to show people around me how good I am. In actual fact, I come to Holy Communion because I am a sinner in need of healing. So Holy Communion, communion in my humility and obedience takes away my sins. That's the sacrifice I bring to God. That's why we can't separate communion from reconciliation, the sacrament of penance. They go hand in hand. I'm not worried that you should enter under my roof. But say the word, meaning, make me worthy of yourself by forgiving my sins, then I will become the dwelling worthy of your love. So we come to Mass because we are in need of cleansing of sanctification, not because we are very holy. So we should avoid that outright stubbornness of rejecting truth, and we should avoid the delusional attitude of thinking that we are holy. Okay? Holier than those other people over there. That's a Pharisaic attitude you must always guard against. Okay? I, I need the Eucharist because I'm a sinner in need of redemption. I need, this, I need the sacraments because they are streams of sanctification. If I have no sin, I don't need sanctification. And then I make Jesus a liar because he has this means to sanctify me, but I'm fine. Yeah. So you should avoid those both two extremes, okay? Okay, so let's briefly Holy Thursday with Friday. Okay, the Lord's Supper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we mean that uh, I said so. Sacrifice is the healing of the wounded, freedom, atonement, purification, deliverance from estrangement. It is healing, the loving transformation of broken freedom. Worship is directed to the other in himself, to his all sufficient sufficiency, but now refers itself to the one, to the other who alone can extricate me from the knot that I myself cannot untie, my sinfulness. Redemption needs a redeemer. That's what we've been explaining. The parable of the lost sheep, caught in the thorn bush, and unable to find its way home, is a metaphor of humanity in general. He cannot get out of the thicket and find his way back to God. The shepherd who rescues him and it takes him home is the word himself. He comes to our rescue. He, it is who, makes his way to us and it takes the sheep into his shoulders. That is, he assumes human nature and as the God-man, he carries man, the creature, home to God. You know the idea of when we say that we have to seek God and know Him? We have to know that even the grace to seek God comes from the fact that He sought me first. He sought me out first. Otherwise, I would not be even have the knowledge that I need to seek God. He came to us, we didn't go to Him. Okay? So, because He came to us, now we respond and come to Him. So creation, created, by, created very good by God, but fell from grace, now finds its purification and return by sacrifice, which now takes the form of the cross of Christ, what we've been explaining, of the love that in dying makes a gift of itself. Okay? So this sacrifice is an act of new creation, the restoration of creation to its true identity. 
okay? So that we may glorify God with our lives again. So that our humanity, human nature, our bodies, which are temples of the Holy Spirit, we can become instruments of divine love. It's no longer me at work, but Christ who lives in me. But that can only happen if we enter through the, the veil, united to the humanity of Christ, the instrument of divine love. So all worship is now a participation in the past of Christ. Usually we use the word Easter, but it's Passover, the past, the Paschal event, the past of Jesus Christ in his passing over from divine to human, from death to life, to the unity of God and man. So that's why we are told on the mountain of the transfiguration, when Elijah and Moses appeared to Jesus, what were they doing? What were they talking about? They were discussing, conversing about his departure, his Passover, his departure from this world to, to heaven. That's the Passover. So they were discussing his Passover, his departure. So thus, Christian worship is the practical application and the fulfillment of the words that Jesus proclaimed on the, that's the, the first day of Holy Week. Palm Sunday in the temple of Jerusalem. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. Okay, the book Spirit of the Liturgy, pages 24 to 34. That's where Pope Benedict explains those realities. Palm Sunday. When do we celebrate Palm Sunday? When do we celebrate Palm Sunday? Which is properly called Passion Sunday. When do we celebrate the Palm Sunday? Sunday for history? When do we celebrate Palm Sunday? When do we celebrate that event? We remember the event that took place in history. Jesus entered his city. Okay? From sitting on, you know, a meal. Okay? Whatever it is. And people were waving branches. Hosanna. Whatever. So when do we celebrate Palm Sunday? Feast of the Passover or Tabernacles or. No, actually, we, we now. When do we, yeah, when do we celebrate Palm Sunday? On? On Palm Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> but in actual fact, there is something very significant not about our leaderships. As we said before, right, Catechism 1085, the events, that everything that Jesus did for our salvation does not pass away. So not these words every time we celebrate Mass. We rush through these things, but that's why we're going to sell it on when we get to the individual parts of Mass, the profound reality of Mass that we shouldn't really rush through it because of the beauty and everything. So Palm Sunday does not pass away. So at every Mass we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord of God's hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in. What is that? Palm Sunday. It does not pass away. So the early church knew this very well. So they saw Christ coming all the time to them. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to take us to God. He comes constantly. So that every liturgy we celebrate, Palm Sunday is right there. And so, and this Palm Sunday is highlighted in the Sunday. Yes, because of the celebration of the Paschal event, which actually took place in history, that's not bound up in history. So remember what we talked about this? The three things that have been liturgy. Number one, the the
MB The commemorative dimension, the demonstrative, the eschatological. So we celebrate these events every year because they actually took place in history. They are not like a kind of mythology, okay? They actually took place in history. So we commemorate. But what we commemorate is not a merely historical event locked up in the past. It's made available actually in the here and now by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's demonstrative. What happened is happening now. Okay? That's the demonstrative. And what happened is happening is moving toward its fulfillment in the heavenly kingdom. But what is heavenly has already spilled over into the now. So memory, commemorative, the now and the future merge in the leadership. There's happen, happening, and then... Will happen in the fulfillment. But the fulfillment has already spilled in the now. The kingdom of God has begun. Moving toward its fulfillment. So we actually live the kingdom of God. But not yet fully accomplished. So what is, what is eschatological? Eschaton in Greek means last, last things. So the, when we talk about the eschaton, like eschatological, we talk about heaven and hell. So don't go to hell. <laughs> okay. So, so this is always very important to remember liturgically. Every liturgical celebration is this. We don't simply commemorate. That's why we invoke the Holy Spirit to make it present what happened. And the Holy Spirit comes from wherever heaven. So, heaven spills in the now. Every liturgical event. Every liturgical celebration. So, as soon as you explain to us about the events that we are about to undergo, yes. happens at every church. Because every right? celebration of Mass yes. is the celebration of the Passion, the Death, and the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why they say, which is not very theological, that every Mass is a little Easter. Okay? <laughs> yeah. But it's not so much, yeah. Every, yeah. Every, awesome. every, yeah. every mass and every mass. Because Jesus is not less on a daily mass or Sunday mass or Easter mass. The mystery, yes. Father, this is the mystery of our faith. Mystery of Fide, the mystery of faith. How do we respond? We have different Christ responses. Christ 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 and we respond. <laughs> okay, the mystery of faith. Christ is in different No, we don't have that. No, we don't have that. The new one now. He proclaimed your death, O Lord, until the end of our we profess your death, O Lord, and a prophecy. We proclaim and a profess your resurrection. Until you come in. Then what, what follows there? What follows there? The mystery of faith. We proclaim the mystery of faith. What follows? In the University Prayer, we'll see that. Therefore, that's what follows. The therefore refers to what we just did proclaim. So it's so beautiful. We we'll see, you know, the the beauty of all that. So beautiful, so profound. Okay. So everything is is it is there. So the fundamental form of the Christian liturgy is determined by biblical faith. This is very significant. This is what we've been explaining. Liturgy is a gift. 
from God. So it is a gift from God, it's revealed. So the revelation is what God has given to us, it's scripted in scripture. So, the Christian form of the liturgy follows our faith. In other words, if you want to see what the Catholic Church believes, where do you go? You go to her liturgies. That's how we celebrate and live our faith. That's why one of the criteria in determining the canon, the books that were inspired, is how they were used in the leadership of the church. Because that is how the church celebrates her faith. In the primitive church. In the early church. Yes, when the canon was being determined. So one of the criteria was that the book was used by the church in the liturgy. Because that's how the church shows what she believes. If it's not used in the liturgy, then that's it's not, it's not our faith. So that's why our liturgy, when you look at it intelligently, all liturgy is divine revelation scripture. The whole mass is scripture at work. Scripture coming to life. Everything we do at Mass. So some other people say, Catholics don't know the Bible, the other people know the Bible. It's like, um, there, there are some foods, okay, it's food, but it needs like it to be, you need to work on it in order that when you eat it, it doesn't really set up, upset your belly. So, the food that the church gives to us in the liturgy is the word of God well synthesized, well taken care of, and we receive it and it doesn't upset us. It doesn't upset our spiritual beings. But other people who have that disconnect between the word and liturgy, they receive the word Okay? And the word sometimes is misinterpreted, so it upsets the belly. Okay? So for us, our word is synthesized. The church reflected, has reflected on it for millennia, and it's given to us in that synthesized way, integrated way in the leadership, and it becomes true life in us. That's why in our liturgies, there are no misinterpretations of divine revelation. It can't be. Now, the priest can lie in the homily, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, some priests do that because the homily is not about the word of God, it's about them. That's why we have to avoid narcissism. Okay, the sanctuary is not a stage where Christ shows up to make people, people, people up to Father. It's, it's serious business. So some priests said things in their homily which are false. It's not what the church teaches. But when they go back to what the church teaches, it is the word of God. Unfortunately, some priests will not follow what is here. They'll add and subtract thereby committing sin. Because the liturgy doesn't belong to me. The liturgy belongs to the church. I'm simply a messenger of the church who professed the creed that I will do what the church does. It's that simple. So I can't do anything contrary to church teaching without committing a sin, especially in the liturgy. Because it doesn't belong to me. It is the faith of the church. And the church doesn't believe in me. The church believes in God. I am not God. My father told us, no, the church doesn't. The church is wrong on this. Mother Angelica, I think one time she tells a story where she told a man, who, yeah, this was, I think, a man who came to her and said, well, no, there, there's, there's no hell. Father told us, no, there, there's no hell. There's no hell. Then simply she told him, well, 
You will believe that there is hell when you meet your priest. <laughs> Yeah. But when it's church teaching, it's church teaching, and the church cannot misinterpret scripture because the church has the charism, the bishops and the pope have the charism to lead us into all truth, and the Holy Spirit guards them in such matters of importance. Not when they are speaking, talking off whatever, or playing or whatever, but these are authentic, official documents of the leadership. So they are authentic, and the church can go. Well, I, always, I always tell people, if you have difficulty believing what the church teaches, okay, officially, not when Father said whatever, okay, but officially the official teachings of the church. If the church teaches officially, and you have difficulty with that teaching, just to do it. If it is wrong, the Pope, the bishops, whoever, will explain to God, not you. you your explanation will only be the church taught. But you must know what the church teaches. Okay? Because if we can say the church teaches when the church doesn't teach. But if it's authentic church teaching, we are safe. If God ever questions me about it, my simple answer is, I did it because the church taught it. So it's not my God will say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are safe. Following what the church teaches officially. <laughs> yes. Okay. Why did you do it? The church told you. Period. Okay. So glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be for all the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for coming. Next Thursday, we don't have a class. Thank you, it's Holy Thursday. Okay. So, if, make sure that when you go to Holy Thursday, make time, take time, to also go into adoration. And this is even if it's five minutes. Okay. The adoration is, yes. remember, when um, Jesus, after the Last Supper, he went to the garden. And uh, he told the disciples, who are they? Peter, James, and John, to watch with him. And they fell asleep. So we must watch with Christ as he undergoes his agony for our, for our salvation. So that's the adoration after Holy Thursday. We are in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus Christ keeping watch with him. Pray that you may not be subjected to the test. Okay? Thank you.